Welcome. This is a September 3rd Jalen Zones production user call. We have Antrenig, Nick, Tara, Jan, Jamie, and myself, Michael, so far. This is the Do Not Hallucinate edition. Antrenig discovered while doing some Illumos documentation that there is an explicit chat GPT feature, Do Not Hallucinate, which leaves the blanks to the reader as opposed to just making stuff up. What a plus. There's a link here, which is docs.omniOS.illumos.am. And welcome, Jamie. You are our developer of record. Uh, it sounds like, Antony, you have a question or two for Jamie? Yes. Uh, I did get a confirmation from the Yerevan State University that I can take a student for the next nine months as an undergrad, and their work can be of my choosing. So I have multiple ideas for this kind of a project. One of them is Michael's suggestion, which is a ZFS GUI application where from a user perspective, they just install a program and now they have ZFS on Windows or ZFS on Mac or ZFS on whatever. And there's a tiny GUI applet cross-platform. We actually ended up agreeing on uh, either you know Pascal, so you know, Delphi or, or Free Pascal Lazarus uh, to have a cross-platform system for that. But the other idea uh, that came to our mind is adding a uh, dash capital U to the jail command where it would start parsing uh, you, what was it? UCL? Universal Configuration Language. Yes, UCL files. So it's like the GL command does what it's supposed to do, or if you pass to it the dash capital U, it will parse the file as a UCL file. Uh, basically, it will start calling the, UC, the, the UCL private uh, library from the FreeBSD base. Uh, very similar to how package works uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the overall idea that I have in mind for this undergraduate student. So we're talking like, you know, basics or mid-level knowledge of C. We're talking uh, something that university professors can understand when he's graduating because they did not understand my last project, which was terrible for the student. It's like actor model in Go. Well, they don't have no idea what Go is. They have no idea what the actor model is. So that, that wouldn't work. So at least this is something that they can understand. Uh, we're looking, it, it, when we end up choosing the jail command, I was wondering what would the process be? I assume it would be something similar to the process of Google Summer of Code, where like, you know, we start working on this maybe for a month or six weeks, uh, send a patch of like a basic draft to get review, I guess, from Jamie, if the code is terrible and we should die, uh, uh, something in between, I guess. I don't know. And if, if, it, if it ends up being good and merged, it could be a good case study for other professors or people like me, dropouts, to uh, take students to work on FreeBSD with undergrads. So winter of code, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, did you hear any of that? Yes. Um, well, offhand, I say you, you can't have dash capital U. It's taken. Damn it. Okay. Aww. That's uh, that's update, right? Update. Uh, no, dash U and dash capital U are different ways of specifying a username to run a jail under oh, in the old yeah. command line version. Yes. 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 Okay. And, you know, even though it's just a backward compatibility thing, it's there and has to stay. Okay. But, you know, that's a small detail. Um, that leaves C and L. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, probably dash dash UCL. C is taken, but, so uh, create. <laughs> UCL sounds good. I mean, people like Lua these days. I One of these days, I got to get into Lua, I suppose. L is also taken. Hmm. For clean environment. <laughs> so. Yeah. This is one of those commands where the uh, days of one letter flags are numbered. Precious, yeah. like V4 addresses. Uh, Jane, I guess I guess we'll just do dash dash UCL and be done with it, you know? <laughs> yeah. That Have you or, done that kind of project? Uh, Go ahead, Jan. Change the default based on uh, file suffix. Change the default based on file suffix. Um, so that if a okay. file name in, ends in dot .ucl, okay. you, uh, uh, Feed it into the other parser, okay. which would also make it possible to have a global jail.conf include uh, something dot uh, UCR. Okay, that that sounds very interesting. Yes. Yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. but 
Um, my review, which is still open and I'm waiting for feedback on, uh, to add the option of reading uh, from an executable configuration Oops. means that you could just have a, the executable be a UCL to gel.conf converter. Yes. So this will, yeah. So that I have yes. a, if I get feedback on that, so that just can move forward or. Uh, yeah, Jan, I would I would also think, and this this might be a dumb idea, but I've seen this happen in a lot of other places. Which mm -hmm. Slurm is a good example, actually, where your your executable could spit out uh, pound uh, format UCL, right? Pound format UCL, similar to pound pragma something in Dtrace, right? So like uh, the user could do something like that as well, I guess. Right, so if if the users program executable, if if we end up merging your your commit, if the users program is a spitting out uh, UCL files, they could just like include uh, that string up there, right? Pound format UCL or something like that, and it could work too. I guess that that would be something that I would love to have in in consideration. Computer audio seems only be oh sorry, that's not for me. I guess not for you. Is pound format UCL actually part of the UCL spec? Uh, no, that just came on top of my head because of like, oh, okay. like pound pragma, I don't know, hertz equals Similar 20. to the mode line. Yeah, uh, I guess, I guess, Michael, that would be pound format spa space UCLs, right? Like, so, uh, yeah. Jamie, have you done that kind of project, be it GSOC or JSOC or otherwise? I have never been over someone else's project before no okay and had interns or anything or just kind of if it's a review no. it's a review source doesn't matter i yeah i've just uh you know i've, I've taken things individually through much but have not uh done anything official in that way cool uh jamie any news in general be it descriptors i think when uh, you were talking to Jan, you mentioned the word mythical that's that's still where my progress is okay and Jan, any questions from jamie regarding your review d46284 uh jamie did you have any time to look at the code oh, <laughs> oh, uh, just a second four six two eight four I have not looked at the code. I'm still just iffy on the idea. And it seems that you got some, at least some amount of uh, comment that was also Yeah, I that. got stylistic uh, uh, ah, recommendations yeah. by Kyle Evans, which I all implemented. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, in the start of his stylistic things, he mentioned, I'm a little torn on the idea itself. And that's where I am. Yeah, I just... So, it, it still seems I'm to me that... I'm also conflicted if it's a good Let him idea, but I... Uh, think all the alternatives are worse. See, that's that's where I, I differ. I, I think the simpler alternative of an executable that creates a jail comp file and then runs jail keeps the uh, complexity out of the command itself. And uh, yeah, we could have, stick something in the RC that says, here is a script to run first or something, you know, a run this before we do other jail things or even make it separate RC. I mean, those make the RC more complicated, but I think that's better than making the jail command more complicated. So another interesting thing here is that, and I've seen this happen in real life multiple times, where a system administrator would easily do chmod777 on a directory. We're talking PHP applications, configuration files without understanding because in the old days, it was because the forum told them so. In the new days, it's because chat GPT told them so. And uh, uh, I could easily see this becoming like, hey, I just chmoded this ETC uh, because of some issue that they had. And now my jails are not running anymore because it's expecting a program instead of a configuration file. Like that, that yeah. I, I could easily see this becoming uh yeah i don't have much pity with people who have uh 777 uh 
executables or files which just contain arbitrary shell scripts executing as root. Uh, if you're doing that, you cannot be helped until you understand what you've done wrong. You have to stop and understand um, Unix. Um, you're not ready to wield it. Okay. Sorry to say. Off topic. Um, so in defense of your idea, it sounds like it could be external without intruding much in the joke. No, management. it can't be can't? A, a mm -hmm. external because if it is external, which is totally right, you could have an RC script which runs before jail, but it means that now you can't use this interactively anymore. You cannot do jail-c because you have an inversion of control. The control is now has to come from outside of the jail command. It now is part I didn't you say you can only use it from some external wrapper. You have something which is persisted to disk uh, by the earlier script, which can go out of sync. So there are lots of problems here, which, yes, you can script around it, but they're all painful. They're all not easy to automate around. They're not, yeah, they're just hostile workarounds. Okay, perhaps take a moment to elaborate <laughs> on the review the the irresistible value of this idea. And if people agree, fantastic. If they don't, well, we'll take another stab at it. Because yeah. there may be a completely different approach like the way dot .include arrived in response to Goran's remarkably sophisticated and arguably complex pr proposal that uh, was replaced by a ridiculously simple, elegant idea. Anyway, anything else on that topic at this time? No, I just wanted to ask if the, if, if we agree that the dash, dash UCL is a good idea, then we should continue or that, or Jamie, if you think there's any other low hanging fruits that an undergrad can do as part of their uh, graduation, then I would gladly take that project as well. At least in the jail. Um, I don't really know of any offhand, no. Just fix those Thank escapes, you. I'm sure a junior student can fix that. But I'm bummed. Anyway. Redo the RC script. You know? <laughs> okay. Tara, you had some questions and news. Or news uh, and yes, I have a few news. So, as you know, the Podmon testing has started yesterday. A few oh. things are coming in. Um, First of all, um, the, the Ansible script. Um, the Ansible patch has landed in the ports, uh, but um, it's working, first of all. And But the package has not built yet, has not been built yet. So it will take, I guess, a couple of days before that will actually be a usable, um, a usable patch or a usable package. Um, I provided, so I'm updating the official document readme file from the foundation. Um, I created some examples, easy example with Podman, uh, either to install Podman and to, um, uh, to deploy a container, and they are very basics. Um, and there is actually a contribution from someone else on, uh, on GitHub to uh, deploy Nomad and uh, console plus Podman on FreeBSD. Um, I will give you some preview of the links. Just give me, bear with me. Mm -hmm. um, the, I'm actually in the process of updating the, I'm sorry for the voice, the updating the, the official documentation on, on the readme file, but these are the um, the examples you can play with. One is provided by me, the other one by this fellow guy on on the internet, which I don't know. Um, the other thing that is actually came along today, actually four, seven, seven hours ago, is that another package is missing in Podman. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce this. It's Katato on it. So I'll link you the um, issue on uh, um, on the project, uh, basically, you can run a group of containers like pod in Kubernetes under Podman directly. And this is missing an executable that will be 
uh, Doug said that it will be on the next push on the on the and uh, I believe this is it. So the only thing is that Michael probably you remember we remember the query about who's gonna monitor the issues that will going on uh, during this testing phase. Apparently there is an issue. Yeah, exactly that. There, everybody uh, is invited yeah. to open an issue on the uh, official GitHub um, repository. So, and apparently Doug is actually active on it. So this is the issues link is the last one there. So that issue is the missing uh, um, Catatonic executable, executable table in the suite. So that will be the part, probably part of the next update. Okay. The first two links are example of Ansible. That would be. And the third one. Cool. Now let's take a peek. Okay. And that is indeed fresh activities now that everyone's out from their little summer houses. Cool. And there's Doug's response four hours ago. This is very active. Yeah, it's very active. Very active. I'm, I'm oh, great. quite impressed, to be honest. Cool. Yeah, Doug hasn't been able to attend for a few a little bit, but uh, uh, let, I'm sure he has much to report. Issue. Okay. Any other questions or news at this time? No, I I have to play with uh, uh, with reducing the OCI image footprint in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, unless something else came up. Okay. Yeah, I I I, I don't have a, a question about the OCI part because this has been uh, killing me. Um, which I guess also ties with Jailer. Uh, do we have any um, tools, imports, and packages that allows us to give an OCI uh, image or a link and get the root FS out of it, like all the school root FS instead of the layered root FS? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. It probably build AH is able to do mm -hmm. that. I see. Uh, so a build H is a way to build the container, even if you don't have the actual Docker. So yeah. if, when you do Podman build, you're actually using build H. And yeah. build H is able to manipulate those images as you like. This is how I built the base um, FreeBSD images. So I found like a jailer mount the, the build H um, loop into a directory and then I expand the uh, previous the um, free. I see. Oh, build yes. Yeah. 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 Jan, Jan is correct. Yeah. X X C, which over, joined yeah. us a while back. Uh, his his also his his uh, jail manager utility can do that with OCI tar, which I think is written in Rust, if I'm not mistaken. Or Go, one of the two. Uh, build um, a yeah, like build, build a H is in Go as well as Podman. Okay. Hmm. The other one is in a Rust. Okay. Yes. X, X is, is in Rust. Yes. Got it. Okay. This, Thanks. just for your information, I I have not tested it yet. This is also part of a suite, but it's slightly for something different. Topio. Well, here's some homework for you, Antonegi. Here's Copio. Thank you. And Andre, that's just so you can leverage the uh, ecosystem and throw it in a jail, I take it? Yes. Aha. Uh -huh. Any other questions related to that? The where there's an open bug that can result in very large- Large tarballs. Tar that's yes. which project? That, oh, from XC. 
Okay, got it. Uh, I'll put that in the note. Uh, oh, CI. Basically, when it runs the ZFS diff to pass what changed it and then build up a list of the changed files and directories, whenever it finds a directory, it recursively adds it to the task. So every changed directory gets a copy of everything underneath it for every directory change. Hmm. Uh, ZFS div list, so you can easily end up with 10 copies of uh, something in your tar just because it's added re repeatedly. Uh, there's a flag to change that in tar, and it's a one line change to the tar uh, command it invokes. Hmm. Um, yeah. Cool. But uh, I don't think the bug is relevant when it comes to unpacking the archive, so to extract that it, it's Still a neat uh, wrapper around uh, FreeBSD's tar. Because what it does is that it uh, can unpack the images and apply the uh, writeouts so that you don't have to script that yourself. Cool. Any other OCI news or questions? Antoneg, anything regarding Jailer? Yes, so uh, we have an internal 0 0.1.3 we will be releasing soon. We have a lot of bugs because we changed a lot. One of them is we removed VM behind the FS manager code. Uh, historically, it was a copy paste of their uh, ZFS management code. And uh, uh, while we're not using all of it, we realized that we're using only part of it. So we ended up redoing that. So we're not sure how production ready is that. Another one is uh, we integrated the jailer file, uh, which I showed the proof of concept of a two, three weeks ago with a lot of Yon's input. And we finally figured out about the trace uh, command that we were talking about. It ended up being a, um, a jailer colon trace colon a random name, uh, it, which is what it would look, look like, kind of. Um and uh, and 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 the name is an arbitrary name that the user can define, right? So now you would have some kind of uh, ZF uh, D trace integration in, into that in, into Jailer as well. One new feature that the customer requested and we implemented on the spot was is a Jailer image shell, which which was very interesting idea. Well, Jailer image shell, the idea comes from NixOS or Nix package system. Uh, it ended up popping out a root uh, of, 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 of a type and you do whatever you want inside of it, right? You do whatever you want inside of it, you know, install packages, blah, 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 whatever you want. And as soon as you do exit, it turns into an image that you can send or receive somewhere else. So like, this is a very good idea if you want to create a image uh, in a very fast way. And uh, we added a new bits into Jailer where it would remove uh, it would remove um, host-specific things, like if if by accident you configured um, networking in RCConf, it will remove that because that's the operator's job, not the image creator's job. If you defined any kind of, uh, if you logged in into a user, it will remove the history for security reasons so you can check uh, properly in the future and stuff like that. So uh, the, the image, the jailer image shell command seems to be very interesting for our customers at least. And we ended up using um, uh, just out of the spot and thanks to your uh, link that you sent, OpenBSD's HTTP D daemon uh, as, uh, as an exchange between servers, right? So like all of the images gets RCP'd or via ZFS send into a single uh, web server. And whoever mm -hmm. needs the image, they just, you know, curl or fetch in case of free BSD and just, you know, ZFS receive. And congratulations, now you have your your images you need and you can use them. So uh, kind of on that way, we we I, I, I also posted about this on, on the Fediverse that the good thing about OCI is the amazing ecosystem. And the bad thing about OCI is the too, too much tools in the ecosystem. And in our case, we have like a very much more simplistic approach, which the customers do like. One comment was, you know, PKG install MariaDB is easier than figuring out which environment variables and which data directories and which ports you need uh, compared to Docker. Uh, but then again, it's it's it depends on the use case, I guess. 
Um, we'll, be we'll, be, we'll be testing this with our customers, including uh, you know on production for multiple hospitals and such. And as soon as as soon as that's done, we'll we'll release it to the public uh, in zero point to one point three. Um, and uh, I finally properly integrated NetGraph Buddy. Uh, we're loving it. The ten gig per second uh, connection between the jails uh with vnet is is impressive it, it, that's the least that i can say and we figured out the magic number for if q max len it's 125 uh, not 2096 <laughs> apparently it's it's 125 which is the default in pf sense and open sense uh apparently they also did their research before setting it up so uh yeah q q q max len q len max q max len yes the Q -max, Q max length. Okay, so let's see. Did you type? Is, did you just do a uh, did you just do a binary search to end up with one hundred twenty five? And is there a reason why uh, so one hundred doesn't work and one hundred twenty eight is not needed in your benchmark? Um, or is there a downside so, to going higher? No, the, the, my the, new uh, memory right, right. interface. Right. Right. So Rod said that 2096 seems like a very large number. Can you start playing with it? I said, okay. So we started going, uh, that's, that's, that's a four, by the way, Michael, not a yeah. two. Sorry, um, yeah. Um, keyboard <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we started going down, 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 down. We arrived at 128, obviously, you know, when you're going down. And uh, a colleague saw that while I was doing, he had no idea what I'm doing, by the way. He's like completely oblivious to what the hell am I doing on that system. And his comment was, oh, I saw that in, in our PFSense deployment on the appliance is 125. I'm like, what? So I said, okay, let's, let's do 125. There were no retries. The speed was correct. And the default, remember, is 50, not not. Not yeah, thirty-two, no. not yeah, not sixty-four. Exactly. It was fifty, so it was, uh, yeah. Um, so I'm like, okay, hundred twenty-five seems reasonable. We had no issues. Did as much performance testing as we could, uh, you know, up ten gels, do speed testing, blah blah blah. Everything went fine. Couldn't complain. So, uh, and I reached out to Daniel to let him know as well. Uh, okay. Which also we found a bug in NetGraph Buddy. Yeah, it was about. NetGraph buddy uh, did not understand interfaces with a dot in them. A very common case would be EM0.69, if you have EM0 on VLAN 69, right? So, uh, so we ended up uh, just renaming the interface, right? Just rename the interface to something else, and it works. Daniel, however, figured out a way to fix that uh, without the renaming uh, in his latest version, that is not merged yet, so that will be coming in the that will be in there in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you, thank you, Daniel. If you, I know you're not here, but you're probably listening. I'm sure his ears are burning. Um, on the jailer side, nothing else. The data center upgrade also went fine with a lot of microtics, and now we're playing with the veil switch. Uh, for VM Beehive and Beehive overall, because uh, we're doing PCI pass through right now, which we're very happy with. However, we're thinking of growing the number of VMs, and I don't want to grow the number of NICs in order to grow the number of VMs. So uh, let's see how Veil solves that, that problem. Hopefully, I'll report in a couple of weeks. Cool. Any questions for Antrenig? How many uh, virtual machines are you expecting to run on your host? So we're currently running a single one with one terabyte of memory. It was one and a half terabyte of memory of, of the VM, but apparently Linux is not good with a terabyte plus of memory. The scheduler just goes nuts. Uh, so we went down to a terabyte. Now this is working fine, except that now our users are abusing the all of the process, right? So the goal is we deploy a very small VM with 64 gigs of RAM or even less actually, just for them to log in, that's it, uh, since NFS is shared anyway. And then we'll build uh, four other VMs with 386 gigs of memory, four or five other VMs of that size, and then Slurm, 
the not simple anymore linux scheduler manager blah 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 will do all of the you know the scheduling right so it has a cluster mode you type in a command in your in your login vm and if it's all shared over nfs then it will arrive to the other machines as is execute blah 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 um so we might end up doing that i am not sure yet this is a very uh, the, it is an economical question rather than a technical one actually because do we want our users to abuse uh slurm has limitations but configuring c group is a pain in the ass uh and then you have to teach c group that hey if the user is running the command apply limitations but if the user is running in a slurm apply the slurm limitations it's like it's a whole nightmare i actually miss rctl rctl is much nicer it just is it's, it's absolutely much nicer i wish we had rctl in, in 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 linux but it's not the case so i hope that answers your question about our problems um, but as long as you're uh, below like 60 on a decent NIC, uh, you can just use a PCIe pass-through. Below what? 60. Oh, I see. You, you're talking about doing... Because uh, you can have... Uh, depending on the NIC, you may lose one or two for management, but you can have up to 64 uh, virtual functions, but some of them may be reserved for administrative stuff, depending on the NIC. You might have just saved my ass. I was, I was having th this problem like today. And uh, actually using virtual functions would make a lot more sense than veil because we already have a proper 10 gig switch, you know? So that would make Depending a lot more sense. Depending on the NIC, uh, you can bypass the line rate limitations and get, just use the NIC's internal buffer management. So, that hmm. the tra so on some NICs, supposedly the traffic doesn't even leave the card and is switched internally. Yeah, uh, running at above line rate, potentially, but that's not something you can rely on. On others, it's, it loops through the port and the switch has to handle the traffic. That's a very good point, Jan. Thank you very much. Yes, I totally forgot about virtual functions. This could be very good for us. No, we're not planning to go above 60. We're talking 16 max. Right, so with, modern server Nick should handle that. Yes, thank you. That's that's a very 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 good point. Yeah. The downside is that you have to create them at boot before you start. So you just over allocate, pre create them, and then you can use them. I don't think that's true. Do, it it is if you use uh, the the con setup command. Mm-hmm. Uh, it deconfigures the physical interface completely and reconfigures it, which destroys all existing virtual interfaces. Oh, I see what you mean. So if I configure it for, let's say, 15, and then I add the 16th, then or it will destroy all of the... if you want to reconfigure the... an existing interface, I which see. is a really nasty part, because, for example, if you want to change a virtual interface's forced MAC address, yeah. you have to... Uh, destroy all other virtual interfaces, which on a VM host is very invasive. Oh, I see. Okay, that's that's a good... Yeah, for example, for my jails part, where I'm doing management software, it would be totally fine. You know, stop the jail, do blah, blah, blah with the other NIC, and then restart it. That's a, that's a very good point, Jan. Thank you. Yeah, this is... This not is... really. It's not really fine if you uh, use uh, the non-password virtual functions and uh -huh. pass them um, into a... Um, a VNet VNet jail. Enable jail, mm -hmm. the interface would be destroyed and then get recreated in the host. Uh -huh. You would have to remove it in and reconfigure it. And everything inside the VNet would be right. confused because the interface and all its associated routes yes. disappeared. Yes. So I would have to you could stop the jails. It, mm -hmm. You could run the ETC net IF script and have it reconfigure, I don't know, a DHCP client or something if you use DHCP to provision, uh, but it would be um, total traffic interruption at the I see. very least. I see. A very short one potentially, but given how slow drivers are sometimes to enumerate stuff, it could also take tens of seconds of network interruption. I see. 
that's a that's a good point. Yes. Okay. Okay. But I do get the idea. If I'm assuming I'm going to have 16 uh, VMs top, I'll just use virtual functions, create 16 of them, pass those to the VM, and uh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's a very good point. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. I, now I just have to make sure that NFS is working properly because NFS is our biggest pain right now. Uh, I mean, you know, we're talking terabytes of data for scientific purposes <laughs> and. Uh, uh, yeah, and we're getting weird. I mean, Are I don't know. Are you using the Nix for anything but NFS, which is traffic intense? Well, there's also SSH, but that's it. I mean, just users logging in and using NFS. I mean, that's all they do. They don't do anything yeah. else. We even have a separate jail for downloading software. I'm like, hey, if you're downloading from AWS, use this jail so you don't overload the Nix or whatever. So it's it's a it's, it's been not a nice experience. And this is a Linux-specific issue, as far as I can tell, with, with our NFS. Because uh, with the same configuration, I boot for ABSD on the same NIC and do NFS on that. Uh, and it just works fine. But booting Linux, specifically with a terabyte plus of memory, it has been not a good experience. Uh, I'm sure there's an issue somewhere in there. I just have to spend some time to debug. And unfortunately, eBPF hasn't been helpful which is a whole other story. Luckily, Michael and I did not start a D-Trace group because then I could complain how eBPF could crash your system by accident, yeah. which is like you had one job, you know? <laughs> so if you're uh, up for nasty uh, tricks, what you could do if you have two NICs in an active-passive uh, setup because you mm -hmm. don't have... Uh, a multi chassis link aggregation on your mm -hmm. switches, probably. Yeah. yeah. And okay. then you can use a, a pair of uh, of uh, trunk interfaces, uh -huh. uh, bond interfaces on Linux. Okay. And not trunk, so that you have um, one active passive pair, uh, use the one interface as primary and the other, the other one, and then you use one for. You use Bond one interface right? for yes. your NFS traffic and one for the other so that uh, they don't conflict on the first hop normally. Uh, and it still fails over to use a single NIC if you do the switch or something. Uh, it's hacky, but it's a good trade-off for budget setups if you have someone who can understand such trickery. That's a, that's a, that's a good point. Yes. Okay. Anything else on uh, networking Valhalla? Moving on, Eva, how's your audio? Your clacky keyboard was impressively clacky. Is that the mechanical keyboard? It is. Yeah. Oh, no. We could feel the mechanics on our head, yes. <laughs> Sounds sometimes like you it's have really fun. loud, sometimes it's not so bad. Um, oh. BPP I News. All of my emotional expression from the news. Uh, I'll remember to mute next time I'm typing. That was great. It's, it's a perfect effect. It's kind of like those phone trees that have a pretend agent that doesn't <laughs> exist trying to reassure Yeah, us. I need a headset and some uh, more cables to be. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't even mind next time using a typewriter or like VT, you know, all those cool keyboards that would be even funner. Oh, absolutely. Uh, let's see. Okay, so storage stuff. So last week, some progress was basically halted for reasons not really technical and oriented in whatever. Uh, so Part of the back and forth of going through a bunch of iterations on setting up these colo hosts and then rebuilding and so forth and so forth. Um, kind of getting a little tired of doing the storage uh, bits and pieces through uh, the sole terminal and going through a lot of scripts that I've written in the past to, to manage all the usual stuff. So I decided that I could just bring out some old configurations and um, former methods for doing diskless booting for the hosts and run all of the storage on the big ZFS array that is already available for that. So, uh, so I started working on the on some updated Ansible playbooks to leverage uh, iSCSI remote ones and 
then use the built-in iSCSI boot features on the X710 Nix to hmm. get this cool. all ready to go. And uh, yeah, it should result in faster spin-ups for hosts and faster uh, VM provisioning since the storage will all be on much more performant systems off a very fast network. Um, how is the iSCSI handoff via IS boot K mod treating you? Uh, sorry, what was the last part of that? Um, so the out of tree kernel module IS boot for iSCSI boot mm -hmm. uh, has been problematic in the past, but it can pick up the NIC configuration uh, from the iSCSI boot to make it available to the um, iSCSI initiator in FreeBSD so that you can reuse the iSCSI session. Mm, smart. Uh, yeah, by building up a smart. fake TCP socket in the state of the existing iSCSI connection and then continuing the iSCSI session so that you have a DA0 boot device uh, from the NIC or the, through the at low time, it's still running the option worm. So the loader can read from the disk and then um, the kernel takes over. And normally at that point, you're um, out of luck unless you booted a MFS root kernel. Uh, but with this kernel module, um, supposedly uh, you can just continue that session and then boot off the iSCSI connection as root device. Yeah, and then see, like at runtime, the iSCSI daemon can then run. And unless you're out of luck, and it, you should probably, I uh, don't know, the RC scripts already make sure that it is unpageable and so on. So that, and always resident, there is a proc CTL flag for that. So that its code is never paged out. Yeah, um, I have been using that one for, um, for some of the larger hosts that are doing um, well, let's just say there's no swap enabled on them and they are only running everything through RAM. So I, I have that um, already figured out for the loader. So that's pretty useful. The problem isn't swap. It's uh, if a page of clean code, which is unmodified from disk, so it's clean and under memory pressure, the kernel may page out a piece of code of a running executable, just a page. And if it's the wrong page, you cannot reestablish the because <laughs> the because the code to do it is paged out, <laughs> and then you would yeah, uh, panic. Um, after a few timeouts, or you would hang, whatever. Um, yeah, because of that, I'm wary of really net booting like that, unless it's completely to into an MFS disk, so that it's com at least on such big systems. Maybe a small user land is worth just keeping in memory as a MD device. Just hmm. strip down, strip out the debug symbols and big tools, and have a small ish uh, user land with package base or OpenBSD, whatever tool works. Can get it down to. Yeah, a few hundred megabytes. So, Eva, do you have any blockers or you just use? are plugging along doing it? I'm just plugging along doing that right now. Cool. So these are great notes, though. I appreciate it. I'll start looking into those, uh, specifically MFS boot and the uh, continued iSCSI sessions look really useful. And will any of it be virtualized? And I say that because Jan's over the year or two had some nifty CTL Vertio SCSI syntax that lets you have pretty pluggable storage, which was a nice breakthrough for VM. Yeah, it certainly could be for virtualization. Absolutely. Uh, uh, what I did is I used Vertio SCSI support in Beehive and guest operating systems so that you have a virtual host bus adapter inside your guest and all your disks are attached to that, and I implemented it using the C, uh, the CAM, so our FreeBSD SCSI subsystems uh, target layer, CTL, 
the CAM target layer allows it to be both initiator and target at the same time um, so that you can create virtual CAM ports, which are basically virtual host bus adapters, and then have a mapping between the ports view of the uh, LUNs and the hosts view so that each virtual machine only has access to the LUNs it's supposed to have access to. And uh, it's hot pluggable and hot resizable storage, but hot plugging and unplugging doesn't immediately generate a notification event. So the guest uh, has to be convinced to rescan the SCSI bus to notice changes. Um, either via some kind of guest agent or uh, re eventually rebooting, which would be the dumbest way or the ugly way to induce a fault, which you know the guest will handle by rescanning the bus. Hmm. What about if uh, multipath is used so that it can just uh, resync on the host side? So all of this would be with, uh, in the case of iSCSI, the iSCSI initiator would be on the host. Um, and uh, whatever you do there is mostly hidden because you go through the CTL indirection inside the host kernel. So you can, anything which is uh, a storage device, so anything what is used to be a block device or a file or a host uh, RAM disk can be exported as a, a CTL target, which then the initiators via Beehive or CTLD can access. So, yeah. um, if you want your virtual machines to be their own iSCSI um, initiators, um, then you don't need any of this, and you just need a fast NIC and a virtual machine boot device, which knows how to access that. On FreeBSD, for example, what you could do is you uh, could use uh, rerouting on uh, Linux pivot root so that you have a little read only boot device, which you kind of keep around, but at runtime you don't use it. But that's getting into very bespoke deployments where even if you, the user would notice, you have to maintain all of that infrastructure. Yeah, some of this is definitely uh, an attempt to reduce complexity in the long run. Of course, building mm -hmm. out this type of infrastructure is not going to be just cut and dry immediately. Um, and yeah, the user land stuff should be, I think, running in memory. I like that idea, uh, especially with the minimized uh, footprint for the operating system. Um, if, go if you have a small user land in uh, memory, uh, maybe. Um, so FreeBSD has this little known feature called uh, nboot.conf, uh, nmount.conf, sorry. The, the, or mount.conf. Uh, the mount.conf on the root file system can instruct the mount code in the kernel, which mounts the root file system, to be a little bit scriptable, and you can forward it so that you can have a root file system which can then contain an ND image, which then gets used. Uh, or you can even specify a timeout and an on fail behavior to panic, reboot, retry, continue. Another option try multiple, or in the end, ask the user at the prompt. So the main page is called uh, this. So it's not widely known and hard to Google uh, for, if you don't know exactly what it is. Mm. And yeah, I don't know how you would use potentially tarfs because the normal seek costs of using a tar archive as root file system don't really apply here. If it's in memory, um, seeking is quite affordable. And yeah, but the uh, clever part to do would probably be to put a, um, have a little file system and then put a 
compress your uh, uzip image on it so that you can have a zsdd compressed uh, image in memory because uh, that also if, yeah sadly uh, geom uzip doesn't support us at four i think it only supports deflate and that standard so that standard is fine from a compression ratio it's good for its performance but I would like to see as at four just for performance reasons, especially when you want to have a compressed RAM disk. That standard is yeah. Some of that would be offloadable with the, I assume with some of the CPU extensions. Like if uh, uh, I think some of the new ARM processors have deflate acceleration, don't they? If I remember correctly, those are memory map device drivers, not instructions. Similar to how uh, deflate offloading via um, IOAT uh, works in Xeon systems. Mm -hmm. Cool. That sounds great. Uh, lots of very interesting ideas to evaluate there. So I'm going to be writing a lot of documentation. Oh, that's at the point I was about to make. Thank you. Yeah. So much is not me. documented. <laughs> yes. So it's that person who got it working somewhere and then left that job, and that was that. Okay. Mm, bummer. Anything else yeah, while we're at it? Somewhere. Go ahead. What was that? I was in a repo somewhere in quotes. No. Yep. Cool. Anything else? I look forward yeah, to Yeah, I, I just oh, a similar question to similar question to Jan. Uh Jan, since I'm using VLANs and with virtual functions, I guess I would I would have the IXL0 interface on my host. I would create a virtual function. I would pass the virtual function to a VM and then I would create the VLANs inside of the VM or just use an access port. Did I get so, that right? Um... Nothing, no. Um, you have to create the virtual functions. Um, it depends on your NIC whether it's better or possible to use the physical NIC or configure a virtual function for the host. Okay. Uh, I think on some of the um, Connect X456 cards, there's a painful uh, but non obvious performance hit if you don't use the virtual interface. Mm -hmm. Once you've enabled the functionality at all, so we're talking about a like eight gig on a forty gig card, and it does line weight when you use the virtual function on those. But as soon as you enable that feature, you should use it, and the firmware pun and driver combination punishes you if you don't. Um, I see. I so see. the next step is then um, on some drivers, but not all, because the Configuration you is just passed with uh, UCL and then forwarded as um, um, an NV list. Mm -hmm. So it can contain more or less arbitrary values and some drivers have, I think, support for VLAN filtering. I see. So that basically the NIC enforces that this virtual machine only accesses a specific VLAN, but that's driver specific. And um, not all drivers can do that. And would wisdom rolling in. Go ahead, Montenegro. And, and and would let's see. Um because my problem is when my device, I think it was the X770, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. the Intel card on FreeBSD had a bug when some random amount of time later, I remember that it would print mm -hmm. not enough buffer left and like the whole system mm -hmm. would hang. I'm afraid of seeing that again. It's like a PTSD coming to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, th that's my worry uh, of, of seeing IXL0 on, on FreeBSD with that card. And I'm not sure if this will happen again if I just use virtual functions. Maybe it was because it was using it. But now, but in this case, I will probably not be using it on FreeBSD as an interface, as in up, but rather just doing um, IOVCTL on it. So th that was my only worry there. But uh, I guess I'll try and I'll report in, in next week. So, uh, or even during the Beehive call, as far as I can tell. Um, 
And yeah, and, and I don't know that I don't think that that bug is fixed. Sorry, Michael. And, at, and, and the parking question that is that it those. would uh, try to allocate a four kilobyte page to grow its uh, list of administrative command buffers for the yes. NIC. And the malloc is flagged as must not block, so it can fail. Uh, and then it fails and it does not gracefully handle that failable memory allocation failing. Failable uh, memory allocation failing, that's a t-shirt. So yeah, um, it just calls malloc in the kernel uh, for asks for four kilobytes and then makes a Pikachu face when the kernel says, no, no, I don't have four kilobyte of continuous virtual memory available to hand out to you aligned to page boundaries with out blocking to make physical memory available once your kernel heap has been up for a while and yeah it, it happens uh, it, yeah I don't know um, I know we looked at it but uh, I don't know if it would be good enough to just say, yeah, you're allowed to sleep to allocate that memory, or that would uh, break things even worse, because then you would deadlock something, waiting for it, or you hold a, a non-sleepable lock in that context where, and you can't release it, or you would have to release it all and then mm -hmm. agree on a locking uh, order and protocol uh, to uh, regain all of the non sleep blocks you're holding, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the driver code. Okay. Well, I'll 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 I'll, I'll try and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And uh, since we're talking the storage as well, uh, and this is just uh, uh, sound. I, I it might sound like a noob question, but. Uh, would it be a good idea for my uh, VM to have two NICs, one for users and one for just NFS? Or like, would a single NIC make sense where it's, you know, users logging in and NFS? Because, I mean, I can have multiple, but I'm just trying to understand if anyone here has, you know, larger scale NFS experience, if if that would be a good idea or not. Uh, you know, so like, I do have four NICs. On the on the system, you know, should I use one of them on the host to expose NFS or export rather, and then uh, two NICs for the host for for the VM, one for the users and default route, and another one just for NFS. Would it make a difference? Does anyone have any experience with that? My system gave me a curly apostrophe. Yes, systems do that. It's neither NFS nor VM specific. Storage likes dedicated data path. Okay. And so the problem only. is that uh, all kind of storage, it doesn't matter if it's NFS, SMB, iSCSI, uh, biological, whatever, it's very latency uh, sensitive. Yeah. And if you have bulk transfers of just fighting with it for bandwidth, potentially really causing congestion on the mm -hmm. interface. And then you have the NFS uh, connection to, uh, okay, let's do one second back off or so, uh, and collapse the uh, um, entire system the connection window. Uh, and suddenly everything is terrible. Yeah. Periodically, but it, of course, it's not a hard fold. It's after all, TCP is reliable. It will continue to, Chuck along, uh, driving you into um, eventual insanity. Intel NVM update package. That's for the NIC. Yep, that's right. That's for the firmware flashing process. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I somehow I missed that package. Intel NVM update package is able to flash the NIC. Okay. I hope they fixed that. If they did, I'll be so happy. Okay, I'll try that. Thank you. I, I my eye missed that package somehow. Um, the thing is that the Intel X um, seven uh, whatever series is the first big rearchitecture of the Intel NIC since the ten gig 
chips came out. So they um, went from more dedicated silicon to a more flexible, potentially more po powerful, but also sluggisher to react um, firmware-driven approach to what, instead of putting more into an ASIC. And so they had lots of crap in the firmware as well. For example, uh, originally it, was, it just stole all of the LLDP traffic from the host so that the Windows driver for the NIC could get the LLDP out of the card's registers. And the other operating system was totally confused because why the fuck uh, are LLDP frames invisible on that card? Even if you put it in um, promiscuous mode and try to capture all traffic with TCP dump, on a light, it's totally hidden from the driver unless it knows how to turn that off. I think one of the firmware updates made it so that this functionality is off by default. I think your system is old enough that there's a good chance it has usable firmware uh, pre-flashed because the chips aren't new by this time. Sluggish error. Sluggish error. Sluggish error. So some things which had dedicated hardware in the older NICs are now uh, sent a message via an administrative queue to uh, the microcontroller inside the NIC. And then the microcontroller has to process the message and send you a response instead of you read a bit in a register. But of course, it's a lot more flexible. Tara has a question via chat. Out of curiosity, if your NFS traffic will stay on the host or if it will go through it, the it, virtual it network go, into the host? It will go outside, yes. So uh, we have, a, for the newcomers, I have a, a very fat machine, two terabytes of memory, uh, 256 cores. Uh, and on top of it, we have a VM. The VM is currently 200 plus cores and a terabyte of memory it used to be terabyte and a half. Uh, and we saw a lot of dead kittens in there. Like we're talking UEFI bugs when you reach terabyte plus with like page overflows. It's, it was just a, this was uncharted territories, I guess, for everyone, uh, as far as I can tell. So um, the VM is running Linux. This, that's where my scientists do their compute, right? We're talking bioinformatics, DNA, blah, blah, blah. The host is FreeBSD because, well, they ask me to manage it, and that's all I can offer. Um, the, the VM currently has a pass-through NIC, which is the Intel NIC, and it would go to the MicroTik switch and then come back to the host on a separate NIC where the NFS is being exported. And uh, I don't like this kind of setup, personally speaking. I, I like it when data is local and not over the network. And uh, I also don't like virtualization. We, we tried to do Linux jails, but there were some issues. But the goal is, on the long run, is to bring all of their scientific software to FreeBSD rather than taking 
previous due to some very weird uncharted territories. Um, that seems to be a much, much more viable solution. Of course, the problem is that software developers only think of two operating systems that exist. It's actually macOS and Linux. They don't even think about Windows when they're writing scientific software. So uh, that that's that's one of the op uh, options that we have. Michael, of course, DM'd me saying, or run Linux on the Super Micro. We tried. Oh my God, the performance was terrible, especially when it came to uh, disk. Uh, the network was fine, to be fair. Um, so we had we had a very terrible, very. I mean, I actually tried running Gen two with like you know the modules that I need, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a very terrible experience. Um, I don't blame them, of course. I mean, Linux does a good job with a lot of things, but storage is not one of those. Um, and we're talking like, okay, the driver is this version, the firmware is that, and your kernel is this. Go figure. Like it's a, it was a, it was a soup, basically. Um, so that was one of our biggest issues. The current setup is working fine, except when NFS is like, I'm gonna just not work, you know, and. Uh, it seems to be a Linux specific thing because with the same setup with FreeBSD, with the same scale of moving files or processing, everything is fine. Well, I even tried OmniOS just to make sure that uh, that's the problem and booted OmniOS and then used LX jails, sorry, LX zones, uh, Linux branded zones, and it also, everything worked fine. So I'm, I'm not sure of what's happening there. Uh, but again, the, the customer is very happy with the setup. The, everything is working fine. Every once in a while, NFS is like, I'm very sad. I have to go into Linux, see which process is doing too much I.O., stop it with the, you know, a signal, and then do sync, 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 three times. A habit of RC dot shutdown. And when it's all flushed, continue everything. Of course, now that we have a slurm, I can stop everything and start everything, all of the jobs all together. And it continues for like a week, two, maybe three weeks, and then it just stops again. So um, let's see how it goes. But um, I can see FreeBSD being a way better platform for scientific software. To start with, we have better packaging. Uh, the Linux community is suffering from the packaging right now. It's like, do you do you have Debs? Do you have RPMs? Is it working on Ubuntu or Debian? Oh, you're shipping Docker. It's like a, a whole nightmare of package management that the scientific community has. Um, and there was a very good talk, if I'm not mistaken, during the last or the one before that, EuroBSD, BSDCon, where scientific software was being run for data for data for data for data science specifically, was being run on top of FreeBSD, and uh, they had very impressive results. And most importantly, is like <laughs> flat pack snap. Yeah, I know, right? Flat pack is a whole other nightmare. And another one is uh, they had a very good case where like, hey, you need Python 2.3. Sorry, you need, you need Python 3.9, 3.10. Well, we have each jails for those. And you just null of us mount whatever you need. You don't need any kind of hardware. Resources. And everything is much smoother much closer to the bare metal. Um, but that's the long goal, that's the long run. And it, it's not a lot of software. We're talking We're talking like about 500 pieces of software. Yes, <laughs> a piano burning, did, that, did I get that right? So um, that, that's, that's, that, that's the situation of scientific software um, that, that, that we can see. Um, and I did talk with other supercomputer operators. I mean, ours is not a supercomputer, not even close to that. They don't have these kind of a large machines. We just deployed the supercomputer in, in Armenia. It's basically a large number of machines that have 64 cores. It's not that each machine is fat, but rather the whole cluster is. So uh, uh, very uncharted territories uh, with a lot of stories in our previous videos about uh, UEFI issues. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a whole... Fire of dumpster. Yes, thank you. Yes, it is a fire of dumpster. And it's been a good case study for us. By the way, Michael, we can't hear you. <laughs> Indeed, there was some chatter in the background. Well, Great work, everyone. You've got your projects, your blockers that were hopefully getting past. And I put the text of that pin up. The strongest steel is forged in the fire of a dumpster. 
So anything else or shall we call it good and move on with our days and our fall madness session that seems to take place every year? Oh, Antrenig, you haven't been here in a while. Would you like the honors? Thank you. Please like and subscribe. We would love to have seen more of you. There you go. Thank you, everyone.